You're tuned in to More Living with Jim Brogan. Broadcast live from the Brogan Financial Studios at News Talk 98.7, where old-fashioned values, expert knowledge, and genuine understanding come together to give you the retirement straight talk you deserve. Jim's a former National Advisor of the Year recipient and a financial educator, and he's here today to talk about how you can live out the best years of your life. Jim and the Brogan Financial Team have been helping retirees and pre-retirees across the Southeast for over 20 years in their pursuit of financial independence. You can reach them during the week at 865-862-6800. So sit back, relax, and get ready to learn, because more living with Jim Brogan starts now. Welcome to More Living with Jim Brogan, where it's all about living the best years of your life your way. This is News Talk 98.7 WOKI. When you think back to the beginning of your working life, what did you picture your retirement would be like? You know, how did you think it would get funded? At the beginning of your career, your vision for your retirement financial strategy probably consisted of a healthy Social Security check and a pension plan that made up whatever your Social Security didn't cover. That sounds pretty simple, right? Both Social Security and pensions are forms of guaranteed benefit plans, meaning it's not as much your responsibility to be your own investment planner. But the year is 2023 now, and your retirement plan will look much different than the simple pension and Social Security duo. You may consider part-time work through retirement. You are more liable for your retirement investment performance. And there are complicated factors you're responsible for when it comes to your investment choices. In today's show, we're going to talk about the many reasons to consider, to consider doing some work in retirement. I'll also talk about the question many of you may have, will we see a recession in 2023? We'll talk about target fund target date funds in retirement accounts, especially in 401ks and 403bs, and the details of ETFs, exchange traded funds, that you may need to know. So last week in my dollars and cents segment, I talked about many of the benefits of working even part time in retirement for a few years. And the traditional retirement, the one where you work for some time and then you stop and do nothing, is really transforming. And while you may not want to be forced to continue to work more years than you want, there are scenarios where you actually may want to work in your retirement. There are two big reasons. Of course, financial security is a key reason many people choose to work during their retirement years. You know, I'm online here, and I'm at a, an investment website, and I'm reading the headlines. And two of the top eight or ten headlines, one says, retirees remain anxious despite a decline in inflation. And it showed that a majority of older consumers remain skeptical that the 8.7% Social Security cost of living adjustment this year will keep pace with rising costs. And then the next article, future generations better not follow boomers down the retirement, quote, road to nowhere, end quote. You know, life expectancies are increasing, and that puts more pressure on retirement savings to last longer. To make up for the pitfall, people are working part-time jobs to provide supplemental income to make their retirement last. So longevity of life is a big, it's really the mother of all risks in retirement. People are living longer and longer lives. A typical 65-year-old married couple today, one of you would be expected to live to 94 years old. So that's 29 years, and 25% will see one spouse live to 98. And that gets into what many times can be a danger zone. Uh, in terms of retirement planning. Because if you think about all the other risk factors to your money in retirement, you know, the risk of losing a lot of money in a bear market. If you live longer, we're going to have, I mean, you'll probably see three or four bear markets in your retirement. Uh, Inflation. We're all worried about that. 
the longer you live, the more that that becomes a factor. Healthcare costs. With people spending more time in their later years, healthcare costs associated with aging can take a big toll on your budget, not to mention costs for the same products and services that continue to rise over time. So reti- and retirement funding has shifted from defined benefit plans. Now that's where your standard pension was. It was a defined benefit plan. You worked for your career at a company and then whatever you made the last usually three to five years and the number of years of service that you had defined what your benefit would be. So it is a defined benefit plan. The company put the money in there typically and then it provides a structured income in retirement. Well, now everything is shifted, or not not everything, but most have shifted to defined contribution plans where you and or your employer make contributions to a retirement account, like a 401k, or if you add money to an IRA, or to a 403b, or 457, or other employer-sponsored retirement saving and investment accounts. You know, these types of accounts, they don't, de- they don't define a benefit in retirement. Rather, they are tax-advantaged vehicles for you to invest for your retirement, putting the onus on your funds to achieve returns that can fund your retirement. So with the added emphasis on depending on your own savings and the fact that more and more people are living longer and longer lives, and then the extra health care costs that can come with that. Working some, especially in those early years of retirement, can make a tremendous impact on financial stability, especially in the first five years of retirement. You know, those first five to ten years are so critically important. If you live 30 years in retirement, your first ten years, whatever happens to your money, in those first 10 years will determine 80% of your outcome in retirement. In other words, it's not, you know, what happens in any given year in retirement. You know, let's say you live for 30 years. Whatever happens in year one, does that have one thirtieth of an impact on your retirement over the 30 years? No, it doesn't work like that. Having a big hit to your money in those early years can be really catastrophic. So one strategy financially that can really help offset that risk is doing some part-time work because then you have extra income, which means you don't have to draw as much from your retirement savings. And putting that off just a couple or, or a few years can often make a dramatic impact. And we can model that. You know, we can model that at Brogan Financial and show you Exactly. You know, if you retire and you, and let's say you work part-time and your income is cut in half, let's look at your income needs and how much you would then need to draw from Social Security, or excuse me, from your life savings, how much you would need to draw from your life savings. And we can actually model that and show you how even just two or three years of part-time work at the front end of retirement can have a dramatic effect. Now then the other main reason why retirees may want to work some during their retirement years is it keeps you active both mentally and physically. And I also talked about this last week in dollars and cents because stopping work altogether is a major lifestyle change. You know, at first you may relish the ease of future of, of fewer responsibilities, but we're human beings after all. It doesn't take long for us to get bored and feel the urge to work again, be productive, be helpful, participate in the world around us, and devote ourselves to something challenging and fulfilling. You know, stopping work can lead you to relax a little too much. Without activity, your brain and your body can deteriorate faster than it would have with a more physically and mentally active lifestyle. And then, of course, the emotional and social void that social that stopping work can, can end up leaving on you. Uh, the social void is such a critical thing, and there have been numerous studies that have indicated many retirees, they just need more purpose. 
and they don't have the social interactions they used to. And so, you know, working part time can help with that actual transition where you don't just go from full work to nothing. So there are really a lot of benefits to consider there. Uh, and maybe, you know, you can consider if you're, uh, you know, many of our clients, when they first retire, are able to continue to do consulting work. You know, maybe you can take two or three months at the front end and not do anything and then pick up the consulting work. So you can kind of scratch the itch of having a couple of months of dramatically reduced responsibility. But, you know, if you've had an active career, I have a feeling after a couple of months, you know, many retirees report that they're feeling, you know, where do I get my purpose, my social interactions, and all those things. So going to part-time work can really help with that. And then, of course, as I said, it makes potentially a tremendous impact on the financial plan. Uh, and like I say, we can model that and actually show you exactly how dramatic an effect that that can have. Now, we talk about all of the major financial planning issues that, that you really need to address in retirement. Now, when I say all of them, what I really mean is there are seven major things that I think people need to address. And uh, I will be at Pellissippi State Community College uh, through their adult education program and outreach out at, out at Hardin Valley. I'll be there. I'm teaching the class financial or how to thrive financially in retirement. And it's on March the 2nd and the 9th, 6.30 both nights. It's two two-hour sessions. So thrive financially in retirement. You can go to PellissippiRetirementPlanning.com, and you can see a syllabus. You can watch a quick video. And then you can also click to register directly with Pellissippi State. Uh, I'd love to see you there. And you can go there and see those seven key areas that we talk about. So again, PellissippiRetirementPlanning.com. You can also call Pellissippi State's Adult Education directly at 539-7167. That's 539-7167. When we come back, will we see a recession? What is a recession? What causes recession? And how might it impact the market, and your investments. So stay with us. This is More Living with Jim Brogan here on News Talk 98.7 WOKI. Welcome back to News Talk 98.7's Brogan Financial Studios, where Jim Brogan is coming to you live with important news and advice to help you achieve your dream retirement. Get ready to learn and live. Here's your host, Jim Brogan. Thanks for tuning in this morning to More Living here on News Talk 98.7 WOKI. I'm your host, Jim Brogan. We are with you every Saturday from 9 to 10 a.m. and again, 3 to 4 p.m. You can catch all of our podcasts online. Go to BroganFinancial.com and click on radio. Will we see a recession in 2023? Well, first, let's define this. What is a recession? The classic definition that we've always heard is two successive quarters of negative GDP growth. And that's a definition that's used in many uh, societies around the world. Uh, In the United States, that is not technically how we determine recession. Uh, We have a a nonpartisan independent group called the National Bureau of Economic Research. And they look at a variety of different factors in addition to GDP growth. You know, when you have a $28, $30 trillion economy, or over a, it's not quite that high, over a $20 trillion economy, uh, can you boil all that down to one number like GDP? As an example, uh, in the first six months of last year, we had two successive quarters of negative GDP growth, and there was a lot of debate. Are we in recession? The National Bureau of Economic Research says no. Uh, I will argue that the first six months last year, the economy was stronger than what it appeared to be. 
looking back with the negative GDP growth. And some of that was affected by, the, the negative GDP growth was affected by our trade deficits, which doesn't necessarily, see when we have a higher trade deficit, GDP growth is lower. And that doesn't necessarily mean the economy is, is a problem. We had positive manufacturing, we had low unemployment, we had a lot of good things. Now then I would also argue that the positive GDP growth that we saw in the second six months, maybe the economy under the surface is not as strong as it appeared to be. How much was inflation masking a little bit what was going on in terms of things like corporate profitability? We are seeing some downward uh, expectations with corporate profitability which is kind of an expectation in the market that we may see recession. But the National Bureau of Economic Research looks at a variety of different factors to determine whether we're in recession. Now, what can cause a recession? You know, ultimately, a, a recession is a decline in economic output and activity. You know, typically, if we see unemployment go up over a half of a percent, we're probably going to be in recession. Unemployment has dropped. It's now 3.4%. It was surprising when that happened in January. Uh, so unemployment has remained very low. I believe recessions are typically caused primarily by the Federal Reserve and the government missteps. You know, the, the Federal Reserve policy and federal government's reaction to economic Chaos tends to, be, tends, tends to be a swinging pendulum that goes back and forth in, a, in way too severe of a motion. The pendulum goes too far to one side, and then it comes back and goes too far to the other side. Well, we had such easy money policy for the 10 years leading up to 2020. Interest rates were kept artificially low. We had massive amounts of money. Uh, that was being printed and put into circulation by the Federal Reserve. And then the pandemic hit, and while everything shut down, and we certainly had decreased economic activity, we had massive government stimulus out of Washington, D.C. So we had just an, um, uh, an incredible amount of cash being thrown at things over the last 10 or 11 years leading up to this year and to last year. And so then we had an inflationary problem, and we still do, and the Federal Reserve is aggressively tightening interest rates. So what causes recession? I believe more often than not, it's the Federal Reserve and policy from our government in Washington. Now then finally, are recessions bad for the stock market? Uh, well, not necessarily. I'm looking at the last 12 recessions since 1947, so going back to World War II. The average, dec the median decline in the stock market prior to recession was 24%. So in other words, yeah, the market did typically go down 24%, but when did it go 20, 20 and, and some are better, some are worse. Now, ironically, last year we went down 25 to 26 percent if you look at the S&P 500. So the, the, the market does typically go down, but usually it happens before the recession. Several months usually when it hits market bottom. Because remember, the stock market is, a, is always looking forward. Where will we be in five or six or seven months? So oftentimes, by the time we're in a recession, the market is already pricing in us coming out of the recession and seeing positive economic growth. Uh, I do think we are probably headed for recession. Now, will that happen this year or maybe next year? I don't know. And I could be wrong. All right. Uh, but I do think the Federal Reserve is going to continue to raise interest rates to curb economic activity to reduce inflation. The inflation number for January was, was higher than expected. But with unemployment at 3.4%, it gives the Federal Reserve a cover, if you will, to continue to hike interest rates and keep interest rates high through the end of the year. And then what is the corresponding impact on our economy? It's reduced economic activity. So I do think we're probably headed there. 
Uh, if you held a gun to my head, I don't think it will be a severe recession. I think it'll be closer to the, to the soft landing the Fed wants. However, I do think, as I just mentioned, with the pendulum swinging with the Federal Reserve, they'll probably go too far, either hike rates too high or keep them high too long, um, which would trigger some kind of recession. Uh, so I think it's likely, but because stocks don't just move up and down based on economic activity, because it's always looking forward of where will our economy be in, five, in six or seven months, that doesn't mean we should try to time getting out of the market. So what are some tips for how to navigate this challenging economic environment? Well, one is consistent behavior breeds winners. When we have choppy stock markets, choppy, we, we had very choppy market last year. Now, for the year, the S&P 500 was down 18.2%. That is not an historically bad bear market. As a matter of fact, with a decline of 25 to 26% mid-year, that wasn't even an average bear market. What was unusual was the amount of volatility, meaning how much was the S&P 500 moving up and down day to day. Some of those movements were up, but some of them were down. And when we have a lot of volatility, when we see sharp downward movements, we also typically see sharp upward movements. And it would be potentially a big problem to miss out on those sharp upward movements. You know, we like upside volatility. We just don't like downside volatility. And I see potential for more volatility this first six months as we deal with inflation and decreased corporate earnings estimates. And we've got this debt ceiling problem we're trying to solve that will come to a head either in June or early July, more than likely. So I see instability, instability based on uncertainty. Trying to time that could be a a devil's folly, so to speak. Uh, so, you know, I've got a chart here. The last 20 years through the end of last year, if you were fully invested in the S&P 500, you made 9.4% per year. If you had not been invested on the 20 best days over that 20 years, you'd have made 7.18% per year. So we don't want to try to time the market. What we do, do want to do is secure income from more stable holdings. See, we don't want to sell market investments when they're sharply down in order to generate income. We want to leave them alone to go through ups and downs. So the first step is to not have to live on your volatile investments in the short term. Give them some time to go through what is inevitable ups and downs. And then secondly, me measure the volatility in your portfolio and make sure that you have proper diversification. Don't just be in the stock market. Diversification means you have a lot of different investments that if one thing zigs, another thing zags. That way, if one thing like stocks is way down, hopefully they're not all way down. You know, I've got a chart here of the different investment asset classes in 2022. And many have said, well, diversification doesn't work because almost every asset class was down. Now, I am looking at this, and commodities were up 15%. So having a, a, a holding in commodities really helped buffer the loss in the portfolio. But then several of these other asset classes, like value large cap value stocks, bank loans, short-term treasuries, commodities, gold and silver. Now, commodities as a general class were up 15%, but precious metals were flat. But we had several that were down less than double digits in a world where stocks were down S&P 500 over 18% and U.S. bonds were down 13%. So the diversification was still important last year to soften the blow and more than likely, we would expect the value of and benefit of diversification to roar again uh, this year and next year. So bottom line, uh, don't get too caught up in are we going to see recession as an investor. Uh, don't get too caught up in that because in a good investment plan, you prepare for these kinds of uncertainties before they happen 
rather than react while they are happening. In my class, Thrive Financially in Retirement through Pellissippi State Community College, we talk about how to do all that and take market timing as, as much as we can out of the equation. You can go to financial, excuse me, you can go to PellissippiRetirementPlanning.com to find more information about that upcoming two-night class. It's on March the 2nd and 9th at Pellissippi State Hardin Valley through their adult education. Again, PellissippiRetirementPlanning.com. Now, when we come back, we're going to talk about understanding target date funds. We'll talk about the good and the bad. They're so prevalent in things like 401ks and 403bs, so we'll, we'll break it down some for you. Stay tuned. This is More Living with Jim Brogan on News Talk 98.7 WOKI. Welcome back to News Talk 98.7's Brogan Financial Studios, where Jim Brogan is coming to you live with important news and advice to help you achieve your dream retirement. Get ready to learn and live. Here's your host, Jim Brogan. Welcome back to More Living with Jim Brogan, where it's all about living the best years of your life your way. As you listen to News Talk 98.7 WOKI, these days your retirement future is in your hands or more specifically in your retirement portfolio. But investment management is not the easiest thing in the world. And asking you to be on top of your portfolio, maximizing upside and minimizing downside is a tall task. Now, the main place that we typically accumulate wealth is in our retirement accounts, 401k, 403bs, 457s. And target date funds are very, very popular. They do have the potential to ease the burden on you in managing your investment strategy. They also have potential negatives. So what are target funds and what are they for? Target date funds are structured to maximize investor returns by a specific date, usually retirement. So in other words, if you have a 2025 target date fund, the fund is investing in a diversified mix usually of other funds. So it is a fund that buys other funds, a fund of funds, if you will. And it is managing that, assuming that you are going to retire in 2025. Now, if you're going to retire in 2024, or excuse me, 2040, a 2040 fund would assume retirement in 2040. So which one of those would be more aggressive? the 2040 fund, right? Because you're not going to need that money for as long. And that's one of the fundamental things about time horizon. The longer before you'll need the money, the more aggressive you you can afford to be. Doesn't necessarily mean you should be that, but you typically can afford to be more aggressive. So generally, the funds are built for more growth in the early year years by focusing on riskier growth stocks And then they aim to retain those gains by weighting towards safer, more conservative choices, typically bonds, as the target date approaches. They're also used by people working towards a future big expense, such as a child's college tuition. Hey, my child's going to go to college in 2030. I've got some of my money in a 2030 target date fund. So typically, it's a mutual fund. It can be an exchange-traded fund, but it periodically rebalances your asset class weights to optimize risk and returns for a predetermined time frame based on an expected need for income. Target date funds are more common in mutual funds. They have Usually, they'll have a higher level of active management. Um, Target date exchange traded funds that trade directly on a stock exchange are less common. And the, the asset allocation is designed to gradually shift to a more conservative profile to minimize risk when the target date approaches. So the appeal of target dates funds is they offer investors the convenience of putting their investing activities on autopilot in one vehicle. 
they usually come in five-year intervals, a 2025, a 2030, a 2035, etc. Now, it, it, target date funds typically have higher expense ratios. You know, you've got a fund that's buying other funds. So when that fund buys these other funds, those funds have expense ratios, and then the target date fund's going to have some expense ratio. So as a rule, the costs of a target date fund are a little bit higher, not a lot, but a little bit higher. So it is kind of an ultimate set it and forget it type of a vehicle. So one benefit of target date funds is you just don't have to worry about staying on top as much of the changes in the market and asset allocation and the changes in your own risk profile. You know, it's going to work for you. You know, most people that I see that come into my office have put their money in a mixture of, of mutual funds inside their 401k and hadn't really touched it for the last seven or eight years. But the problem with that is now they're a lot closer to retirement than they were, and they're just as aggressive as they were eight years ago. And that may not make sense. So a target date fund provides kind of an autopilot mentality. Now the negative is, is number one, potentially higher costs. Income is certainly not guaranteed. They can sometimes be insufficient as an inflation head. And there's little room for changing your goals and needs. What if you have to retire substantially earlier than the target date? due to some layoff, or what if you decide to work a good bit longer? There's no guarantee that the fund's earnings will keep up with inflation. And with all investments, these funds are subject to risk and underperformance. And because they're on autopilot, there's not active engagement and management when markets are hairy. Now, some would say, well, that's a good thing, because the asset allocation is the most important thing. We don't want to be buying and selling a lot in volatile markets, and there is a lot of truth in that. You, the asset allocation is more important than which funds you use. You know, do I use fund A or fund B or fund X or Y? The actual asset allocation, is it in large cap stocks? Is it in small cap stocks? Is it in technology? Is it in or do you have commodities? Do you have energy or natural re and natural resources? You know, the asset allocation is the most important thing. Uh, my biggest concern with target date funds is the heavy reliance on bonds to mitigate investment risk. So as you get closer to retirement and then as you retire or you get past that target date, the further you go, the more and more they're going to add in bond funds. Now that led to very unsuccessful year last year, uh, but I think the heavy reliance on bond funds as a diversification tool, I mean, bonds do provide some diversification to stocks, but there are a lot of other things that also provide diversification to stocks. In other words, you have a whole bunch of stuff in your portfolio that doesn't just move up and down together. So if one thing zigs, another thing zags. Well, the traditional mix is stocks and bonds. And that's typically what we see with target date funds. But what about things like I mentioned last year, the number one asset class was commodities. What about commodities? What about natural resources? What about non-traditional bonds? Uh, those are bonds that have adjustable interest rates. So in other words, it, it's kind of like a, 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 the difference in a, a, a fixed mortgage and a variable rate mortgage, an adjustable rate mortgage. You know, if you have a 3% fixed rate mortgage, rates went way up last year, you're still only paying 3%. That's good for you. It's bad for the bank. The bank is losing money on that mortgage. If you have an adjustable rate mortgage, you're now having to pay more on that mortgage. So it's worse for you, but it's better for the bank. Well, but uh, non-traditional bonds are bonds that have adjustable rates, so they can go up in a rising interest rate environment. So those kinds of bonds did a lot, did a good bit better typically than traditional bonds last year. So they're just, and, and what about real estate? Real estate is an important investment asset class in a portfolio. And are there challenges in real estate right now? Yes. 
but they can still be a very effective asset class. So it's just hard to get that kind of diversification in a target date fund. But if you look at the choices in your 401k or 403b, there's usually just not a lot of choices. Outside of the target date funds, you might have 10 or 15 different funds, and they don't get into these other asset classes either. So in a 401k, a target date fund can provide a good foundation and maybe layer some things on top of it because it is kind of self-managed and you don't have to worry about, you know, the, the fund itself is rebalancing constantly. But choosing some of the other funds, if you like to stay on top of it and you do active rebalancing and you manage it more, uh, can potentially be more effective if you can pick more diversification. So that's just kind of a little bit of a background of how target date funds work. Uh, my, my biggest concern is the over-reliance on bonds. The good thing is once you're 59 and a half in a 401k plan, you can typically take more control of your retirement account at work. Even if you're still working, you can usually roll most, if not all, of that money into an IRA. Uh, now, there's pros and cons of that. That has to be dived into. Um, but typically, you have more choices in an IRA than you do in a 401k, and you can continue to participate in the 401k. You can continue to get the employer match and make payroll contributions. So as a rule, you want to at least consider a direct rollover uh, first chance you get, certainly when you retire. Uh, but the biggest thing is this stuff needs to be addressed on an ongoing basis. Don't just invest in your 401k and forget about it and never take a look at it. You might not want to look at it in years and month, months that we had last year, but it's important to keep an eye on it and make, not make emotional decisions, but make sure that periodically as we get closer to retirement, we're making appropriate changes. Now, when we come back, I'm going to talk a little bit more about exchange-traded funds, the details of ETFs at a high level of what you need to know. So stay with us. This is More Living with Jim Brogan here on News Talk 98.7 WOKI. Welcome back to News Talk 98.7's Brogan Financial Studios, where Jim Brogan is coming to you live with important news and advice to help you achieve your dream retirement. Get ready to learn and live. Here's your host, Jim Brogan. This is More Living here on News Talk 98.7 WOKI. I'm Jim Brogan. You can catch our entire show on our website, broganfinancial.com. Click on radio. Uh, we have all our shows podcast, as well as our dollars and cents segments and my retirement minutes that I run every week on this station. Go to broganfinancial.com and click on radio. Uh, we'll have this show up uh, by Tuesday afternoon. So we would love to, if you miss part of it, pull it up, download it, listen to it. Um, Got to try to share a lot of excuse me, a lot of good information about things like are we going to see a recession, the benefits of working part-time in the early years of retirement, and other information. Exchange-traded funds, or ETFs for short, have taken the investment world by storm in the last few decades, especially the last five to ten years. ETFs have made the diversified portfolio of equities accessible without having to buy hundreds of individual stocks on your own. But with this pocket portfolio of sorts, there are risks to look out for as well. So we're pretty familiar with mutual funds. So you put $1,000 in a mutual fund, then that mutual fund company is then going to take that money and invest in maybe hundreds of different stocks. So for a small amount of money, you can be extremely diversified. Historically, mutual funds in the past have primarily been actively managed funds where a manager is picking and choosing stocks based on maximizing re return or minimizing risk or both. ETFs, by contrast, historically have primarily been 
index funds or passively managed. The manager is not actively picking stocks to boost return or reduce risk. They are literally trying to track a, 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 some sort of an index. The first ETF was the Spider S&P 500 fund, SPY, Spider SPDR, and it's an index fund. Now, things have gotten considerably blurred in the last five years because the way ETFs, the way the regulations have worked with the SEC, uh, they now can be uh, actively managed, and it's much easier for ETFs to organize where they can be actively managed, where a money manager is making those buy and sell decisions. Likewise, we've seen an onslaught of mutual funds that are index funds. So at this point, yes, do mutual funds tend to be more actively managed? Yes, but there are index funds. And then ETFs, are they typically indexes? Yes, but there are a lot of actively managed ETFs. So, so let's get right down to it. We, what are the main differences? Well, one of the key differences here is getting in and out of the fund. You know, when you, a mutual fund, when you sell a typical mutual fund, or buy a typical mutual fund, you're not actually buying or selling until the end of the day. It's based on the closing price. So if you decide at 11 o'clock in the morning that you want out of a particular fund, you're not going to be out of it until after close at the end of the day. Uh, so that to me is a disadvantage because you don't know the price. Uh, now, we, we shouldn't be trying to time when to sell in a given day. We, I mean, that's, that's very difficult to do. But the bottom line is, typically when you buy or sell something, you want to know the price. So that is a disadvantage of mutual funds. An ETF, by contrast, is sold through the day like a stock. So it is, you, if you want to get out of a stock at 11 o'clock, you can get out of the stock. Uh, if you want to get out of the ETF, you can get out of the ETF because it trades like a stock and you know the price. Uh, so that is a benefit. Now, one other risk, though, that's involved with ETFs is, and I won't get too complicated here, but, you know, when you buy or sell a mutual fund, you buy it at its net asset value. In other words, if all of the shares of that fund were liquidated, what are those stocks worth? And then what is your proportional interest? And that's the price you get. With an ETF, because it's traded through the day like a stock, it doesn't always track exactly with its current net asset value. So sometimes it can sell at a premium or a discount to its book value, if you will. Uh, that can provide an arbitrage or a mispricing opportunity. Now, over time, the way ETFs are, are handled, they're able to dramatically reduce that tracking error, so it's not a huge issue, but it is one you should be aware of. Now, the other most significant benefit is taxes. Mutual funds are very tax inefficient as a rule. ETFs can be more efficient from a tax perspective. And let me explain one way that that happens. When you, let's say an investor, you're in ABC Mutual Fund, an investor in Florida decides to cash in $50,000 in that mutual fund. Well, the mutual fund company is going to have to sell those, sell stocks in order to meet that need. Well, there's tax ramifications when they sell those stocks. And those tax consequences are spread among all the investors in the fund, including you. So there's somewhat of a lack of control of taxation. In an ETF, there can be tax ramifications, but just because an investor liquidates some money doesn't mean the ETF has to sell stocks or sell securities in order to meet that obligation. So as a rule, ETFs are more tax efficient, they're easier to get in and out of, and they have lower fees. However, in many cases, an active money manager may only offer their platform through a mutual fund and not an ETF. Bottom line is, it's important to know these kinds of differences. A good advisor should be looking at all of these options and providing you with the best choices to get the asset allocation you need. We're out of time today. Thank you for tuning in to More Living with Jim Brogan. Thank you, Riley, for running the board and to Jill for helping produce the show. 
Have a great weekend. You've been listening to More Living with Jim Brogan only on News Talk 98.7 WOKI. The views expressed by Jim Brogan and his guests are not that of Cumulus Media. Any discussion of financial, legal, and tax planning strategies is not intended to be individualized advice and is general in nature. Always consult with your advisor for advice specific to your needs. This program's content does not represent a recommendation of any particular security, strategy, or investment by Jim Brogan or Brogan Financial Incorporated.